Hello and welcome to another installment of the Party of Say podcast. And uh, I don't know when you're going to listen to this, but for us, we're weekend warriors. I'm Anthony. We get Tony and Nate. Introduce yourselves. Tell me a little about, about yourselves. Born and raised a nerd, continue <laughs> nerding to this day, live, breathe, nerdery. And that's why I'm here today to, to nerd out. Eat, pray, nerdery. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> live, love, laugh, music. Nerdery. Yeah. I saw a funny meme. Uh, you know those live, laugh, love, or like uh, lick the bowl type thing you put in the kitchen? I saw it uh, in a bathroom. Lick the bowl. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were gonna say uh live love limp biscuit because I did that see works that too. I saw yeah. that too, dude. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah, that works too. Uh eat pray, rage against the machine. Exactly. That's the name <laughs> of this episode. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm Tony. I am excited to to do this on uh another morning, afternoon, evening. I don't even know what the fuck time it is. It doesn't really matter because whenever you listen to it will be what time it is and not uh, what what time it is for us. But we're uh we're we're on the weekend, we're doing a different a little different vibe than typical, but uh, it's been fun to kind of put this one together because I think this is a, a deep in the weeds nerdery episode for us. And it's 90s OG. Everything about this episode is 90s OG. It is a 90s OG. In fact, the homework leading to this episode, I think, cements the fact that the 90s is the best decade of all time. We're very, or I'm very biased, but dude, I mean, come on. This, these we, records. So do we want to debate that tonight too? Or today? Yes. <laughs> we can. I mean, shit. And I, I would tell you that it, for us, it probably is. But yeah, for I'm others, say they're going to say, nah. Very long uh, debate. <laughs> I mean, shit. We'd, we'd have Rob on here. And he'd be like, no, nah, dude, it's the 80s. So <laughs> it's, it all depends on your perspective. But for us, I mean, there's a reason that we love all this music and we talk about it a ton. And it's because we grew up with it and lived it. So tonight, we, I mean, these are all bands we go way back with, or all these bands. There's two bands we're talking about tonight, right? So we're going to lead with a little Smashing Pumpkins, um, Tail of the Tape type of thing, and we'll finish off with a little Rage Against the Machine. And it's, I don't know if you guys thought about this, but we're, gonna, we're basically going to draft Rage Against the Machine songs, but this leaves the door open to do deep dives on any of the albums. So like this is... By design, right? Yeah. yeah. It's, it's, we've actually held off on doing full episodes of Rage, full episodes of Deftones, and some other bands that we've kind of, I don't know if it, like we've really talked about it, but just like in the back of our heads, it's like, I don't know if we want to spend that one right now. But this, we can continue to do the deep dives. We can have members on, obviously. Let's get some members on. Uh, we can do the whole nine with this. So this opens the door. So Rage Against the Machine song draft coming at you later. But first, the boys from SP talking about SP. <laughs> yeah, good call. Uh, Siamese Dream versus Melancholy and the Infinite Sadness. And this was just kind of a random, it came up in our group text. Tuan had a hot take. He just threw it out there and then we like made it, we discussed it. Like, because we do that even when the microphones aren't on, even when the computers aren't fired up, we do this anyway. So we were talking about it and we threw it out on Twitter. And I think Melancholy won, what, 64% to 36%, something like that. And I talked to a couple of friends. Outside of our group text, Rob told me he picked Melancholy because of the, the abundance of songs. And Spose, I think, quote tweeted us and was like, Melancholy, because Siamese Dream is awesome, but Melancholy shows you where they could go. So th there's a couple of people right there, friends of the pod that have been on with us. They gave us their opinion, but we're going to give you our opinion now. I love the background like context for people listening because it's like, we obviously record and it's like an output and a, and a concentration to, to put something out to the universe that's like very dialed. But the fact that it's happening sidebar all the time is like we have receipts, not that it's really needed, but it's like, no, dude, we're geeking out like in our sleep. Well, it's how the a lot of the episode topics start. It's someone has yeah. an idea or has an opinion or you just happen to listen to something. And I'll say this before you even jump in. I put that text out there just while I was listening to Siamese Dream. It wasn't even listening to the whole thing. It wasn't even with melancholy in mind. It was just like, in this moment, SD is the GOAT Smashing Pumpkins album. And I think we'll find out if I still feel that way here shortly. But uh, <laughs> so I don't know. How do we want to start? You just want to give, want me to give my opinion? Yeah, yeah. Give, us, give us your opinion. You kind of let, you, you sparked this fire. Let's, let's find <laughs> out where you, uh, give us the, the moment that you thought about even bringing this text to us. That's a great, I like that. And then we'll go from there. 
So I was I was doing a little workout, doing uh, I think I had like a '90s uh, alt rock uh, station on, and mayonnaise came on. Which it, I'm a late bloomer with mayonnaise, also with the food mayonnaise. The food mayonnaise sucks, but I was a late bloomer with mayonnaise. Hot like take. I I liked <laughs> disarm. I love today. You know, those are the big singles, and like that. I I heard today before I heard uh, melancholy back i think it was on mtv so i liked that but mayo is the goat and that's kind of what sparked this it's like do you it's like with sports is the best player the best player on the court typically is on the best team so that was kind of the thought process it's like is mayo good enough to carry this fucking thing and then i thought about it so then that's when i dropped that text so i'll pause there what, what do you guys love about sd Siamese dream for all you uh, SP noobs out there. So for me, it was an introduction from my older brother with this band. So I got an early start on them. And so you got to think Siamese dreams, 93 Melancholy's 95. Yeah. Yep. So I lived it in the moment, but that was still kind of ahead of my time. I think we've like chronicled that on the podcast where like, when did we actually start to really pay attention? It was like more around the 95, 96, not in the 93, but I did live it in 93 when my brother was like living it. And um, I remember thinking, his voice is really weird. This is super crazy, interesting music. Is this what music is? But I remember specifically when you said like songs like Mayonnaise or even um, like Luna, like the beautiful like ballad songs. I'm like, oh, I can dig this. Maybe because it was just easier to digest, but there was, it was more welcoming, right? Because his voice is almost like, if you don't like it, you're not going to like it. You're going to run away from it. But when you see it, when, you hear him, when you hear Billy sing, you're like, God, he's got a beautiful voice and his his lyrical delivery is just outstanding. So, um, yeah, Mayo, I, I, I agree. Along, I kind of pair it with Luna because they're both, those two songs stuck out back like in 1993 to me. And I was like, oh, this is amazing. It's funny neither of you said Disarm because I think Disarm might be my favorite Smashing Pumpkins song, even though I'll get into why I don't, I don't like Siamese Dream over Melancholy. But yeah, Nate, you're right. We probably were paying more attention around melancholy just because that's as we're really formative music fandom i lived with or i was at my dad's a lot as a kid my parents aren't are together and uh a friend of mine down the road from my dad's place got me into a bunch of different music and smashing pumpkins melancholy we listen to all the time playing super nintendo in his basement so i'm 10 11 years old and we're we're cranking no doubts tragic kingdom back uh we're listening to our Lady Peace back then, but this record, I always came back to this record, and the two of us always came back to throwing on Melancholy, because it was just, it's two CDs, it would take forever to listen through the whole thing, and we could just dick around playing video games, and, you know, being 12 years old, 11 years old, listen to this shit, so th that's where I kind of fell in love with Smashing Pumpkins, but Disarm, I think, is the best song on, as much as I love Mayonnaise, and I love Luna, and a, a few, you know, Today is a great song. There's, there's some great songs on Siamese Dream, but I, I think Disarm is at least a top three Smashing Pumpkins song. It's definitely up there. It's definitely up there. And that's the thing. It's like that album has MJ and Pippin on the same team. You know what I mean? It's going to be tough to break that, but I'm not going to bury the lead. I, I do think Melancholy is the GOAT album. I thought about it, and it is. It has the visuals. It has the name. It has tracks. It's just this collective piece of art, but there's a but, right? There's a however. However, if I'm going to reach for an album, it's going to be Siamese Dream. Siamese Dream is less intimidating. It's got less, you know, there's, there's less filler, I think. You got to be in the mood for melancholy. The other thing is, I don't think the singles on Siamese Dreamers played out. Like, if I listen to melancholy, I'm going to skip 1979. I'm, I'm not skipping tonight tonight, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, skip Bullet. But with Siamese Dream, I'm letting all those singles rip, baby. I can just throw it on and let it rip. I like the uh, notion of the intimidation factor, because I think that's applicable to everyone, record label included, where they're like, ah, do you really want to put our double albums? This is hard to promote because people are going to be like, that's a, that's a lot to digest. So, and it's more expensive. So there's that too. So I, I thought that was a good point. But yeah, man, I, I agree. Disarm. I mean, the songs I wrote down today, Hummer. Rocket, Disarm, Soma, Geek USA, Mayo, and Luna. Those are like my top tracks, which is like half the record. 
about pretty much right it's 13 songs you're you're pushing about half yeah yeah and the the rest of that record doesn't have a ton of filler on it even if you're not talking some of those top tier tracks right like it lends itself to putting it on and letting it rock out all the way through because it's it's just a really well well made piece of music i would argue that the first side of melancholy is better than Siamese Dream, just alone by itself. So if you if you're intimidated by grabbing the double album, don't be. Just listen to the to side one or listen to side two. Side two is a little weirder. Got a cool a bunch of cool riffs, different vibe. It has 1979 and 33 and beautiful and a couple of you know quieter tracks on it too. But the first side, I could listen to all fucking day every day. I just the piano intro into uh, tonight tonight, which is probably a top you know, 1090 song into that kind of noise rock riff. I texted this to you guys on Jelly Belly, which you'd think would be a throwaway song because it's sandwiched in between Tonight Tonight and Zero. But no, that's on fucking rules too. And you just, it just doesn't let up. There's no bad songs. Some weird, long, ethereal tracks like Galapagos and Porcelain of the Vast Oceans. Fuck, man. You can't beat it. I love the first side so, so much. And I would say that it's even, I think it's even better than Siamese Dream, but that's just me. So what you're saying is, fuck you, an ode to all of you. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what I'm saying. Yeah, fuck you, an ode to everyone. Uh, I would agree. Uh, disc one, which is what, Dawn to Dusk, that is better than the second CD. Because the second CD, I think that's where, I'm not going to speak for everyone, but I think it's where it lost a lot of people. I think a lot of people went to that for 1979. But beyond that, I bet if you polled people, like even decent 90s rock fans, they couldn't tell you two or three songs on that second disc. And then there's like, there's people listening are like, you don't know me. I'm a big SP fan. Yeah, there might be. I mean, there are more cool tracks on that second side than people realize. Like Bodies is cool. XYU is cool. There's just, there's some funky different chances taken, I think, on the backside, which people should check out if they haven't. I, as good as, I mean, as much as I'm, I'm riding for <laughs> side one right now, I think side two is pretty badass too, just in its own way. I think this is like a common theme too for double double albums. Like you got to think Nine Inch Nails, Fragile. It's the same case, it's front loaded on that first part of that record. Pink Floyd, same thing with the wall. Like I feel like that's not uncommon, and I, I don't know if it's because a double album was just a result of just so much material where like it could have it should have actually maybe been a one record, and they were like actually we can make this more of a concept album and draw it out a little bit, but. It'll be front heavy. Well, I think if we did, you know how we did the Weezer Tale of the Tape episode where we picked categories? I think if yeah. we did that, I think all three of us would probably land on Melancholy. Artwork, I mean, no contest. You know, theme and story and whole package type of thing. <laughs> Melancholy all day. Best songs, I think that's where it gets a little close. I don't think any of us have any over nostalgia, you know, over nostalgia either way. I think we were kind of got into them somewhere in the middle. I don't know. I, I, I think Melancholy takes it. And I'd be interested because that, like we said, that Twitter poll, I had like 25 responses. So that means what? 10 people thought Siamese Dream. I wonder what, you know, are they a little older than us and they grew up with it, you know? Yeah. Nostalgia probably plays a big factor into that. And when you got into the band, I mean, that happens to a lot of people, I think that'll happen. We'll talk about that a little bit in the next part of this episode when talking Rage, where I think all three of us get into them with Evil Empire. As much as we like self-titled, we were all kind of Evil Empire babies, and that's why that, that record resonated the most with us on the whole. And I'm just saying that. I don't know if it actually did. You guys have never actually told me that. I'm just That's the feeling that I get from, from this, and that's probably why we yeah. land with Melancholy versus Siamese Dream, as great as they both are, because they both are great. So we all, I think we all agree that Mayonnaise is our favorite track on um, Siamese Dream, but what about Melancholy? No, no dude. No. Disarm, bro. Oh, Disarm. Sorry. Yeah, that's for me anyway. I'm a Mayo guy, but Disarm's right there. This, I mean. For Melancholy, for me, it's Muzzle. What about you guys? Oh, Muzzle is so fucking good. Favorite track? Really, it, like Tuan said, you kind of have to be in the mood for it. So like I could, it depends on the mood. Depends on what I'm looking for from Pumpkins. Because like, I love an ode to no one. Uh, I love Galapagos. I love Jelly Belly. I love some of the deeper cuts on on Melancholy that don't get, obviously didn't get the time of day. But like, you can't go wrong throwing Zero on. Like Zero's fucking amazing. For me, 
it's tonight tonight. And I think that's a very, you know, cookie cutter response. But why I picked that is how many bands could have put that song together? Not many. You know what I mean? With, with some of these more rock songs that they're not a dime a dozen, but I think there's other bands that could have pulled that off tonight tonight. I, I mean, you might, it might be five other bands on the planet in the history of ever that could have put something like that. And then you throw the visuals of the video on, I mean, fucking mic drop forget about it it's a great call not not many bands are doing that then and how many could you know that that we've listened to in this scene you know in the 90s rock world could have pulled that off probably few very few any closing comments closing comments hmm i mean we were talking about it we alluded to it earlier the 90s is just such a pure outstanding time for for music output this band may be underrated to an extent i mean i think they were definitely in their heyday and they had a full lineup but the lineup has kind of come back together with the exception of uh darcy right but i guess the closing remarks is it was great then but it's it's appreciated in value like these songs are so strong and listening to these songs um recently in headphones you hear like little pieces of you know layering that you didn't hear before especially with uh chamberlain's drumming style you're like god damn this guy's easily one of the best drummers out there and no one talks about him so yeah closing remarks just great band legacy artwork uh le- legacy music yeah man it's just it's great to revisit this stuff because it it underscores everything that we talk about because it's um i don't know it's just beautiful music well and it's why we can probably do this for another hundred and 50, 60, 70 episodes if we want to, because we can do stuff like this where we revisit or pin a couple albums against each other that we, we all love or bring an album to the table that the other two haven't checked out, that type of thing. So it's awesome to do exercises like this because it does help you kind of refamiliarize yourself with stuff that you, you probably spent a ton of time with. And I mean, the same thing is going to happen in this Rage segment coming up. Maybe I haven't listened to Self-Titled or Siamese Dream in this case in forever and putting it on and going through it all. and you know, putting the the magnifying glass on a song and thinking about it differently than I had in times past where it's just been on passively and I've had it kind of while I'm doing chores or exercising like, like you were doing the other night, Juan. It's fun to do both ways. And that's the beauty of all of this is we can do it a million different ways and talk about it and have fun with it. All right. I think we're going to get into uh, the main segment, the main event, Rage Against the Machine. You guys have uh, ever heard of them? Ooh, listeners can't see, but we're bringing back the wheel, baby. And it's uh, bringing back only for rage. But yeah, we're, we're going to do a draft. So like we're going to be almost like a fantasy draft, right? We are going to pick a draft order and individually we're going to draft rage songs. So once a song's been drafted, we'll talk about it, uh, but they go off the board. So in theory, tonight, the product of tonight is you're going to get Patio Slaves like top 12 rage songs is basically how the, the output is going to work here. Uh, I think we're going to, are we snake drafting? Yeah, we'll do a snake draft. So got the wheel pulled up and uh, Nate loves the wheel. We're going to figure our draft order right now. And whoever gets the first pick, then we'll get the second pick. The third pick will go twice and then go back towards the first pick. So snake draft like you do in your fantasy football leagues from the dawn of time here. But let's, let's spin the wheel. All right, we're spinning. We're spinning. We're spinning. Uh, we need Greg's sound effects. I'll find Greg's sound effects somewhere. Ooh, so i don't know <laughs> before we started uh I, w- I don't even know if i finished my sentence but i was i was started to say i hope i don't get the first pick <laughs> you got the first pick and i got the first pick <laughs> so i'll go first and six yeah we'll see who's got the second pick and then who gets to wrap around who i think it's gonna be me yeah so i'm gonna get the second pick tone and then nate you are going to have the third and fourth picks so i feel like this that thing knows how we operate because you know i'm a reactor so yeah this actually might be i mean the first pick is tough because how are you going to pick your favorite rage against the machine song so good luck to one yeah he's your favorite kid <laughs> yeah i mean i struggled with this i think i was texting you like kind of giving like a live tweet and tone was like don't hurt yourself over there and i'm like god damn <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be in, in yeah. the world forever i gotta get this right well we could, like we always say we could do this again next week and it might change so you said something Actually, when we were first uh, chatting about Smashing Pumpkins, kind of segueing into this, which I wanted to start and make a point. While doing this exercise, it hit me that 
my love and favoritism for Evil Empire is highly, highly, highly influenced on the history I have with that album and the nostalgia. It was very clear. It's been chronicled in this podcast of how I, we, all of us pretty much got into them. Well, I know we did uh, in the Evil Empire era. Super transformative album for me. Go listen back, whatever episode that was. And I think I've just always leaned into that, where it's like, that's my album. The visuals rule is maybe one skip on it. You're not taking that from me. But self-titled, man, has tracks. And that'll become very clear, I think, in this exercise, I would think. At least for me. I know like how I ranked these. And I'm going to give us uh, no spoilers. Fuck it. No spoilers. Any opening remarks for you guys before I give my first pick? I think that was well said. I mean, because we lived it, but also just the, the dynamic of this band and the material, especially Zach's lyrics, are so deep. And at such a you know, young age, you got to think, 96, we were in, like, in middle school reading these lyrics, just completely thrown off because it's just so different than anything else that's out there. And even today listening and yesterday listening, like, man, you have to like stop the track look at the lyrics, maybe do a Google search, and you're like, oh, God, he's really, you know, throwing some knowledge out here. So it's, it's pinnacle. But, um, yeah, everything you said, I, I definitely echo. Yeah, uh, I spent, obviously, a ton of time with Evil Empire in the moment because that's where my start was. And, and I think we even talked about that not too far back when talking heavy therapy. And I remember getting self-titled after that and, like, getting ready for school in the morning and putting it on in the CD player in the living room and my mom not really liking it all that much. And just, it, it's one of those memories that stuck with me, but there's so many awesome tracks on it. And I was like, now nah, we're listening to this this morning. Sorry. It was like that. And, uh, offspring smash just shit that she had wanted nothing to do with on the CD player from a, you know, 12 year old at the time. But you're right. There are tracks on, on, I mean, all three, really, if you, you go into uh, Battle of L.A., and then we've done a deep dive on the covers album, and there's tracks there, too, that, you know, they, they made their own that were covered by from other bands. So, shit, man. It, it, it was hard. It was not an easy exercise. It's always fun to come up with a segment like this and then get to the point where you're excited about it to the point where then you're, like, dreading it because you're like, shit, am I going to do this correctly? I don't even know how to where, where to start on this shit. And then coming back to, all right, I'm excited to do this again. And you know what? I'm sticking to my guns. I have a list here, and I'm gonna go in that order. And obviously, wherever you guys fall, I'll you know I'll, I'll pluck them off the list here. So I'm gonna stay true to my guns. The first pick, and this may surprise you, maybe cookie cutter answer, but again, getting into them in Evil Empire, having this be the first song I ever heard from them, Bulls on Parade. It's it's one for me. It's the first song I ever heard. It's where the fandom started. I think it's it could be the most total package. Rage song. It goes hard from start to finish. Right when it kicks in, it's like, all right, we're in for it. Zach, Zach flexes the whole the whole song. Like he's in his bag. You get Morello with the scratches. Like that's one of his most iconic. I don't even know if you can call it solo. The bass tone is perfect. Uh, it kind of gets a little little quiety near the end, and then it just hits you. It just this is one for me, and it wasn't easy. But then when I picked it, I was like, it is. It is, and I think it would be even a casual fan's one, uh, but it's also nerd's number one. Down to the, the visuals, even the name of the song is like captivating, Bulls on Parade. You'd think, you just immediately think of like the bull run in Spain or something like, oh man, aggressive, right. loud. What are they even talking dangerous. about? Yeah, what are they even talking about? What's going on here? Um, great pick, man. I mean, undeniable. And I think, like you said, not cookie cutter, but just an easy pick because it's top of mind for anyone that just thinks of rage, like, Oh, bulls on parade. I know that song, but it's because it's, it is that strong from foundation with the rhythm, rhythm section to Zach's delivery. Like you said, flexing throughout the whole thing, just on it. You can hear his, his passion and, and his singing on a recorded record is as powerful as it is live, but it's very, very much. So the case on this track. It's the number one pick, right? It was my number one pick. I'm sure, Nate, you probably had it at one, too. There yep. are a couple that come close, but if we all had the first pick, I think we all would have taken Bulls on Parade. So I think you got it right, Tuan, and it's uh, <laughs> our, yeah. love, our love for that record, our love for that band, but this song is just, 
if you wanted to say, all right, I, I've never heard a Rage Against the Machine song. I've never heard of this band. Not like, I don't know who that would be, but you'd be like, this is where you start. Listen to this song and go from there. And that's, that's why I, I would have had it at number one myself. Yeah, I was a little nervous. It's like, because this is, we're collectively representing the pot. Like, if, if Nate or Tone had this at eight, I'd be like, well, maybe I'm uh, selling a short here, but I'm, I'm glad we all had it up there. Have you guys ever seen like the alternate cover of the single? No. Uh, I, in kind of prepping for this, first time I ever saw it, it's classic. It's a black and white drawing of a microphone with a grenade uh, for the top. It's, oh, I have seen that. Yep. Yeah. It has the parental guidance sticker. It's just the visuals of the, for them in that era, down to the cover of the CD, to the T-shirt. It's like the mold of cocktails. All that stuff was just, you know, when you're young, you're like, this is, this is cool. What the fuck? This is amazing. Yeah, it's so good. So good. Who's next? Me. Uh, I think I'm next because then Nate's going to have three and four. So I would have picked Bulls on Brave first. I'm right there with you. This was one that I had as a close second, and it's because of what it stood for and honestly how prescient it is still today. Killing in the name. We're still dealing with the problems that this song pushed out, pushed out into the world and explains that it are happening today in 2023 and it's 30 years old right so and i mean we all love the fuck you i don't i won't do what you tell me <laughs> it's it's the, what, what, there was that radio station and was it canada that fired a bunch of people and they just kept playing this song over and over again yeah i remember that to like protest because i mean it can be used as so many different ways rage against the machine can be used as protest music but this i mean we're, we're still living in not to get too political we're still living in a world where this song fits and that's sad, but also why this song is so friggin' so heavy and so perfect. And they know how to, you know, get people going. And this song got, it gets everyone going. Yeah, I'm happy you brought up like kind of the backstory on then and now because it shows that there was such a high concentration on let's put the best possible product out there that stands the test of time. I think they knew that then. They, they might have even known this is only going to be a three album band. You know, we, we're just going to make some solid stuff and, and move on. But um, yeah, the lyrical content and delivery and message in this song in particular is applicable and um, sad. But also for us that had no, like, no idea, internet wasn't even a, part, a thing then, you know, to get this backstory on what's really going on in the world at such a young age was. It really actually, I think it changed all of our lives, to be honest. And I think it's maybe why this band is so instrumental to our musical music appreciation, but also just having an open mind altogether. And this, this song uh, underscores that to, to the T. Yeah, well, I mean, LA riots were early 90s, 91. Yeah. This was 92, right? So this kind yep. of, it carried that narrative perhaps longer than it would have. And it's, it's too bad it's still going on. But I think again i don't know if this is like a hot take controversial take i feel like some of the messaging of not only rage but this song almost gets lost in itself where a lot of people don't know the meaning of it you know what i mean i i would guess a lot of people don't know the meaning of this song or like the history of it and uh, i mean there's people that well, go on twitter there's people that don't know rage's ethos good and, point yeah good point so I, I bring the, all that up to say that actually, I don't know why I bring that up. <laughs> but no, it's a, it's a good point because there are a lot of people that, that like raging as a machine. Go back and listen to our episode with Spose where he talked about seeing them in New York and sitting next to somebody who clearly didn't understand the, the band's, you know, purpose, even though he probably had been listening to them for 30 years and, and loved the music, but did not, didn't just didn't get it. And this song is kind of a microcosm of that where people don't get what it's about. Go read the lyrics, <laughs> you know? And then, yeah. then, then go read the newspaper. <laughs> right. It's the same shit's still happening. No, I'm glad you kind of picked up where I was kind of losing my train of thought, which is they didn't have to write about this. There was no, nothing else was being talked about other than hip hop. Like hip hop was doing it, but there were very few rock bands. Like they didn't have to. In fact, when I was doing research for this, I think because they signed to Epic, when they showed them this song, because they got signed after the second show, I think I, I read. But whoever was at Epic, was like, oh, this is the direction you're going. You know what I mean? I read that very, you know, last couple of days. I didn't know that. You know what I mean? So they didn't have to write about this. And, and I think that's why it makes it so impressive 
to the music, this follows a lot of the great rage songs follow a very similar blueprint where there's a, you know, kind of a quiet start to a buildup and then it just kicks your ass. You know what I mean? And I think that is a theme, especially on self-titled, like really think about like the big, big songs and we'll get to them, you know, bomb track and all that, I'm sure. But similar blueprint, but hey, don't discount the lyrics. Go check out the lyrics if you're not familiar. If you know the lyrics, then you're already in, you're already, already in the club. Did I take that too high, boys? I had it at six. No, it's good. It's a foundational song for the band, like you said. And also, you said something, Tuan, that, you know, that build up. I think we talked about Alice in Chains and how, like, everyone has jocked their style. Like, Rage Against the Machine, they, they designed that build up. And it's probably, probably because the message needs that build up to kind of explode. But it's been replica- replicated in so many different bands. And it always works, especially in the live show. So I think they kind of invented that that build up, but it's conducive to the message. So it makes it, it makes sense. It's a formula. Nate, you get two back to back. Yeah. Are you ready for this? Oh, <laughs> give one, Nate. We'll talk about it for a little bit and then give two. Yeah. The pressure is high. So similar to you, Tuan, I kind of was recollecting on how did this band come to me? 92 with the self-titled record. I wasn't really on the pulse, but evil empire, hundred percent was there from, from the jump. And uh, I got to go with, with Vietnam. I fucking love this song. I think in the moment, I th- remember thinking it was like, it was already controversial given the, the um, subject matter, but just the opening lines and just F-bombs left and right. I was like, fuck, man, this does have a you know, parental advisory sticker for a reason because this song is just relentless. But uh, that one always stood out. still does today. Live, the live versions of this song is also, are also uh, are super intense. Yeah, Vietnam, man. I just, I, I got to use that as, as a draft pick right out of the gate. I didn't have this in my uh, top, we'll call it 10. Oh, wow. When I was whittling this, my list down, I think I had it in, it was definitely top 15, and it was probably top 12. Didn't have it in my top, top 10. But it doesn't mean it's a great track. But it, that doesn't mean it's not a great track. I, I never skipped, skipped this song. Whenever I put on Evil Empire, I always played this song. And this is another one, which is a, a theme throughout the whole album is this album proved that Zach is an MC. I mean, you can tell in self-titled, but uh, evil empire, he could hang realistically probably with anyone. And it's songs like this that highlight that. And certainly bulls on parade the whole nine. Yeah. It's definitely one in the moment, Nate, that I was like, man, I shouldn't be listening to this because I'm 11 and thinking, holy shit, how did, how did I get this into my CD player because of all the F bombs? But then looking back at it now, you're like, no, this is, this is a top track for them. And I, I probably would have had it in a top 10 situation, too. It does prove Zach's ability to kind of play in that world. And people don't, didn't always realize that probably on the first record. But I remember hearing the guys from Run the Jewels say, you're lucky he didn't just go hip hop because he had blown everybody out of the water there, too. So this, this is one of those situations where uh, it kind of shows that. Great call. Yeah, I think the hip hop element was attractive to me then and is today because it is a sta- it is kind of a standout track on Evil, Evil Empire. Now that you mention it, it's a little left to center. Yeah, I love the messaging. If you listen to the lyrics, this one in headphones is interesting because you can hear the production style on Zach's like secondary layering of his vocals, like coming in later. Like he recorded two different parts and they kind of sewn those together. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, definitely signs of the time and how they produced this record, which it's not overproduced, but it's a different style. Because now they would either just drop that second verse, or I don't know, he would pause and do it, you know, in the same take or something like that. Maybe not, but I thought that was interesting because you can hear it, like almost like you can hear where it's sliced and then brought in and then back to the track one. But yeah, man, I, I fucking love this song. So uh, yeah, Vietnam. But it's you know that's that's the interesting thing about these uh, drafts, right? Or or conversations is um we have different takes for different reasons and. Uh, I'm happy we were discussing Vietnam today on this one. Hell yeah. All right, you got another one too. Yeah, oh God, I got so much. It's, it is, dude, this is so hard. I'm going to stick to Evil Empire, even though I got a ton. I'm going to go Without a Face. Another, well, I guess Vietnam's not a deep cut, but Without a Face is a deep cut for sure. The reason this song, I picked this song is because I always liked it. And then when I got the Live and Rare record, I really liked this song because Zach intros the song with, again, more backstory and context on, on what this song actually means. And I was like, oh, wow. So it opened a whole world of 
history and current events and just the 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 real world that we're in which is you know, sometimes bleak but um it gives us some real weight so uh without a face after vietnam and this song is a fucking tom morello flex session like that for the first when it starts like i remember in the moment like not even knowing what that yeah noise is and then you look at the you know the booklet and it's like all these sounds are brought to you by guitars vocals drums and bass and you're like well by process of elimination that has to be guitar but i've never heard anything like it and then you listen to the rest of the album and you're like okay well this is this is just what this dude does this is another one that if i recall has a bit of a build up too right it's that you know almost like staccato guitar noise yeah. and then it kicks in right uh, i did not have this in my top 10 in fact i'd have to look at my list i don't even know if this was top 15 which doesn't mean I'm right and you're wrong or you're, uh, you know, the opposite. But uh, I don't know. Maybe I am right. Maybe you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, deep cuts, you know, it's deep cut rage for sure. It's, but it's an awesome deep cut rage. I hadn't thought a ton about this song until doing the exercise, obviously. And it's the back half of Evil Empire today probably gets forgotten about. And it shouldn't because it's fucking great. It's songs like this and... Uh, Roll Right and Year of the Boomerang, which I know Nate and I ride for pretty hard. Uh, it's it's amazing what they were able to do with just the four of them in a room with, you know, vocals and drum and bass and guitar. Also, uh, Without a Face has that hip-hop sensibility again. Absolutely. It totally. has a stand-up, yep. stand-up track on this record, so I don't know, maybe I'm leaning towards the... Is that Jack for Similac, Fuck a Cadillac? Dude, that lyric... Especially, I was looking at it as it was like streaming by on Spotify today. I'm like, that's so fucking tight. Now that I have kids, I'm like, I even know what that means now. <laughs> Baby formula. Yeah, it's 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 good. Yeah, they were able to pull that stuff off, and and I think that's part of what's we all love about Evil Empire is it's got that sensibility in there too. I think it's me, right? Snake and back. Number five. Oh boy, there's a couple here. I want to grab. I want to grab something off Evil Empire before they're all gone, but I don't know that I'm going to. <laughs> I think. Hmm. This is usually me on the delay. I know. It's either. Four hours later. It's, it's, yeah, <laughs> it's either the, the opening track off of self-titled or the closing track off of self-titled. I think I'm going to go Freedom. I just fucking love Freedom. The end of it where they're like scale up while Zach's screaming Freedom, yeah, right is just fucking all-time Rage Against the Machine. There's nothing like them. This is the only band that could pull this sound off this way, I think. And it's one of those songs that I just remember, oh, we're at that part? All right, I'm turning this up in my headphones, or I'm turning the stereo up, I'm turning the car stereo up. You're going to hear what I'm listening to, because freedom? Yeah, right. None of us are fucking free. <laughs> Who the fuck do you think you are? It's, it's perfect. The song's so good. But yeah, I'm going to go with the closing track off of Self-Titled. Freedom, number 10, which is my, what, second one? Number the fifth overall pick here. Great choice. I had it at number seven, and I think, so this, is, this comes right at you from the gate, right? Zach does his, ugh, and then the whole band comes in. Yep. All-time Morello riff. You're right. It, uh, it's like at the four and a half minute mark. Zach just loses his fucking mind. And I think, again, context is key. He left Inside Out and joined this, and if you came from that world, you were like, well, what is this? This is, you know, metal. This is rap. Like, what, what the hell is this? But I think if you were a fan of Inside Out, there's nothing not to like about Freedom, especially that last minute and a half. And I think that that's that rawness and passion that is really throughout this album. But this is a great way to bookend it. Like, this is the whole album coming at you at the end. And what's not to like about it? Yeah, Freedom is like, Zach's delivery towards the end that you're alluding to is like Ross Robinson style, like making Jonathan Davis cry in the booth while recording the track exactly. type type energy. Like, God damn, he fucking means it in terms of like what the song means and the, and the powerful message in this song. The only other band that could do this, which would be a completely different style, 100 percent would be like Bob Marley and the Wailers. Like there's only two bands. It's like Rage Against the Machine, and Bob Marley and the Wailers, which the message was 100 percent down to earth and genuine. Um, just a different, com completely different style, and maybe controversial at the time because Bob Marley was a was also a target for his free, you know, his free speech and whatnot. But uh, yeah, other than that, I mean, no one could could sing this song, write this song, and and put the song out to the world and have it 
mean as much as freedom does. And I remember thinking about it then and now, and it's, it's again, one, like you said earlier, Tony, this is a transferable song today as well, just sad, but definitely cements the fact that these, these lyrics were meant to, to last a lifetime. It's Leonard Peltier, right? That's the, it's calling for his freedom, mm. right? This is, I'm pretty sure this is uh, what this song's about. Not to mention, like, it's another one of those songs that kind of shows Zach's hip hop prowess too, right? There's some some great lines in there that just fit that kind of world with this heavy music behind it. And the quiet, your anger is a gift is, I mean, fuck. As a, again, 12, 13 year old trying to figure out things like, oh, okay, (laughs) this can be, this energy can be used in a positive fashion, even though it can be sometimes negative, right? So (laughs) it's, it's so fucking, it just made your, made you think way more than I probably should have as a, as a 12, 11, 12, 13 year old. Made you think and made you angrier. Yeah. Yeah. Well, my wife, I, I tweeted this out when it happened, but my wife handed me a, a Sharpie the other day cause I was looking for some and she had bought me some and she said a gift and I said, your anger is a gift. And she had no fucking clue what I was saying. <laughs> and I thought it was funny. And I think you guys thought it was funny, but fuck, it's, it's just so good. Anytime you can just come at your wife with rage against the machine lyrics, you should. I'm going to have to be selective with that, I think. <laughs> oh, totally. I mean, not in no, a bad no. way. I'm not, I'm not, yeah, no, not in a bad way. Just like, I, I do that with song lyrics all the time. It doesn't necessarily get stuck with rage songs, but yeah, it happens. It comes up. I'm just going to throw a know your enemy at you. <laughs> at her. Know your yeah. enemy. How you doing, honey? I'm calm like a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Which is my next pick, right? I'm six. Oh, nice. Yep. Know your enemy. Total package rage song. So you get rage plus you get a bonus of Maynard. And I was thinking you guys would know this. In ninety two, like what was out from Tool at that point? I don't even like the EP. Oh, opiate maybe? Yeah, I'll I think look that was right 92. Up. So like they pulled in oh, they must have been friends with him. I don't know. Or label or oh well, probably wasn't label, but anyway. Opens with like spacey guitars. There's some slap bass in there. And it has it could be my favorite breakdown of all time with one of the best pre breakdown call outs of all time with we don't need the key will break in. And it just goes into that groovy dun dun dig a dig a dun dig a dun 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 totally moshable. If you want to get your mosh on, go for it. If you want to vibe out, go for it. But at the end, it's got some of the all time Zach lyrics. You think about the meaning of this song. So yes, I'm all, I'll tell you guys, yes, I know my enemies. They're the teachers who taught me to fight me. Compromise, conformity, assimilation, submission, ignorance, hypocrisy, brutality, the elite, all of which are American dreams. Incredible. Timeless. So good. Applies years before this, applied then, applies now. And uh, actually, nerd fact, who else contributed to this song? Do you guys know? Besides Maynard? Ooh, I don't know. I feel like I've read this, but I can't remember. Stephen Perkins, Jane's Addiction drummer, provides wow. some percussion. Huh. I didn't know that. I knew it, but I didn't know it three days ago. <laughs> <laughs> but I love this song. This, is, this has been a song that uh, I actually had this as three, my third pick. Mm-hmm. I love it. Fucking love this it song. It is a total package rage song. You're absolutely right. You get everything. And uh, to answer your, your tool question, Opiate was out. March of 92, so in the same ballpark as self-titled. But yeah, we didn't have a ton from, from Maynard and the boys yet at that point, but to have him on that song too is just an added bonus, and it's kind of a cheat code. It probably should have been one just because of that, right? <laughs> With our love for Tool on top of our love for, for Rage. But this is, you're right, it's a total package Rage song, and I, I absolutely love it. And you're right, the end part is so good, all of which are American Dreams over and over again. So nerd fact on nerd fact, first one being they were friends, but they were also roommates. Tom Morello and Adam Jones from Tool were, were roommates at one point. So there was a connection oh, wow. there. Both amazing. Two of the best guitars in the history of music, which is kind of interesting. But I just wanted to kind of circle back to what you said about those, that, those ending lyrics. is kind of how we were kicking off this episode or every time we talk about Rage, which is the fact that it flips everything that we were getting taught in high school or in middle school to present like on its head. It's like, wait a second, this guy's putting this these words into my head at like a fresh age of like 11. (laughs) So we really got ahead of it. You know, if it wasn't for that dude, I would have just been brainwashed like the rest of them, you know, you would have assimilated. 
I would have conformed. Yeah. W- without that, this album, you'd be you'd be having a fucking Billy Joel podcast right now. So I'm <laughs> glad you found your way. No offense to Billy Joel, Long Island's finest. No, we like Billy Joel. Yeah, we're we're fans. <laughs> so it goes back to me, right? Yeah, you're snaking. Yep. So a uh, little little nerd fact here: we've only picked songs from two albums. We have not had a Battle of L- L.A. song or Renegades. And uh, I'm going to keep that trend, actually. <laughs> so with the seventh pick, nice. and I think this was either my fourth or fifth, but my, uh, for the seventh is Down Rodeo. This is nice. the, uh, I think it's the gem of side two of Evil Empire. Like, I would often skip Tire Me, because side two starts with Tire Me. I would often skip, and actually I have uh, original pressing. You can't see it, but OG pressing of this. Wow, that'll be on nice. the social. That'll be on the socials this week, right? Yeah, Somebody will see that. Of course, you bought that in the moment. Obviously, ninety six. Uh maybe a couple of years, a couple of years later. Wow, it, it wasn't nice. too far off. This was definitely purchased in the nineties. Damn, dude, that's impressive. It's an OG. I don't know what it's worth now, but I've always kind of kept an eye on what it's worth. But uh, I cannot be bought. I am not for sale. So uh, I would skip tire me, go right to this. Some of my favorite uh, Morello guitar work. I think it's some of Zach's best vocal delivery with this, with like the staccato. Can't waste the day when the night brings a hearse. Like it just, ah, man. And the guitar work. Like I think I just mentioned that, but I'm just thinking about it in my head. And it just, it's often a go to track and has grown on me over the years. Cause I think we've said this side one was often my go to because I had the tape. So that's the other thing. It's like I would listen to side one. And it's like, all right, well, do I want to listen to Tire Me or just rewind it? And I'd often rewind it and go back to side one. Wow. Uh, it's funny that you had this one. I thought this one would be a stealth one that I would be able to, to grab towards the end. I was hoping to get it at a value pick later on, but you just, I, I actually <laughs> might, have even, might have even grabbed it next. But this song is so, so good. And the messaging around it is, you know, again, go read the lyrics. We're, we're not going to get super political here, but... Go read the lyrics, and uh, it's pretty pretty spot on, I'm sure, uh, for a lot of how a lot of people feel about that stuff. So, but the music is so good, and uh, it, it's the ba- a band at the peak of their powers, right? They put out that amazing self titled record, and then they follow it up with this amazing fucking record with so many different but similar feelings on it. But they give them to you in a different way, and they give you more of that kind of letting Morello breathe a little bit with his guitar and letting Zach show off his either vocal delivery or, or rhyming delivery that this song is, is, you know, right up there with that stuff. So fuck great, great pick. And you, you scooped me on it. <laughs> Just a quiet, peaceful dance for the things we'll never have. Amazing. Simple, but amazing. I remember listening to this song back then and thinking, uh, I don't really know. I know some of what he's talking about. Obviously, like you said, we're not going to get into the lyrics. So they're pretty, um, pretty dark. But just Rodeo Drive, I was like, I don't know what that means. Now I live in, in Southern California. I'm like, oh, Rodeo Drive. Like, that's like the poshest of posh streets maybe in the whole country. And like going down Rodeo Drive with a shotgun. And then I have like these like images of like when there was like full on going down Rodeo Drive like two years ago when everything was boarded up because there was like riots and people smashing windows. And I just immediately thought of that song. So it's like, again, just you know profits in terms of what zach's talking about and it still just stands to the test of time but yeah the song the lyrics in the song are, are pretty deep so we're still at just two albums so we have yeah. tone up at number eight with the eighth pick in the official rage draft brought to you by patio say podcast <laughs> tony <laughs> selects i'm going off the board <laughs> i'm taking a live cover of fuck the police right here just, just to throw a wrench in everybody, everybody's thoughts about Rage Against the Machine and, and this draft and how it was going. Yeah, the live version of Fuck the Police, what, just a, a, a nice little message to the Fraternal Order of Police in Philadelphia. Is that what, what Zach says at the beginning of the song? Live and rare, yeah. <laughs> so, so this is off of live and rare. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, so fucking good. And obviously, not their song to begin with, but a song they made their own. Uh, it's what NWA was, the original. Fuck the Police, but... It fit what they were doing, and to have that, uh, you know, kind of live explosion of this song happen, and and again, we're, we've talked about them taking covers and, and taking songs and turning them into Rage Against the Machine songs. Here's another instance of that. But yeah, 
it's an iconic song from an iconic group that another iconic group has made their own. And I'm, I'm, I'm going with Fuck the Police at number eight. So, Nate, you were a big live and rare guy back in the day. And it was because you owned it. And here's the thing. I never really checked it out until later because I never owned it because it was 30 bucks back when we were you know, in the late 90s. 30 bucks back then is over 50 now. But now you just fire up YouTube. You fire, or is it even on Spotify, Live and Rare? It's on Spotify. It yeah. Is. is it? Yeah. So these kids these days are so spoiled, man. We had to fight and claw for this stuff or pay out the ass. Or download it illegally on dial up. Yeah. Right. Because that's what I did. <laughs> it's been a long time since I've heard this one. I think it was 30. I think I remember distinctly buying it at Bull Moose, begging my mom to buy it for me and like having to do a ton of chores to like make up for it. I think it was $38.99 for an import CD. Wow. One of one, and they didn't have many. They had one copy, and I was like, I have to have this because at the time I had to have everything by Rage. This was probably like '98, so we were yeah still in middle school. But yeah, dude, even the lyrics, like listening to this song in preparation for this as well, or this version of this song, and the lyrics are so of the time, right? Fucking with me because I'm a teenager with, with a little bit of gold and a pager. You know, you're like pagers. Oh yeah, I forgot about those. <laughs> well, that's the '80s with NWA, right? Yeah, exactly. So, but they, I mean, it, it would have worked in the late 90s, too, because we, there were cell phones. And I know, uh, famously, Tuan, you had a, a, a massive uh, cell yes, flip, flip cell phone with an antenna that you pulled out. It looked like a cordless phone from your house back in the 90s, but it was... It did. And <laughs> we called it Zach Morris. But, yeah, it... <laughs> Zach E. Mom. Zach E, yeah, Zach E. Morris. <laughs> but, yeah, these things didn't, didn't happen a ton at this point, either. So, it, it fit. I mean, people were still using the, the little bit of gold in a pager. Just an observation. All these songs still hold up. Oh, yeah. You know, we've talked about the messaging. The messaging, sadly, will probably never go away. But the songs themselves hold up. <sighs> Fuck, man. I don't skip songs. Like, on these albums, I don't. And we haven't even talked about uh, Battle of L.A., which I do skip songs. And that's probably why I haven't mentioned yet. But, man, those first two albums, untouchable. Unfuckwithable, as the kids say. Oh, yeah. So did I break the rules by picking the cover here? No. No. no, okay. no we no make rules. the rules. Especially with a Rage episode, right? There's really no rules. Yeah, we don't need yeah. the rules. We'll break them. <laughs> hey, <good. laughs> there it is. All right. Who's up? Nine? Nate? Yeah, man. I think I'm going to, like you said, Tuan, keep the trend going. I have, I have some Battle LA stuff, but um, I'm going to go with Wake Up off the self-titled record. Standout track for me always has been. Resurfaced on the importance and powerful tempo of this song when it was on the matrix soundtrack in what 98 or 99 i can't remember and it reminded me of how great this song was it was just perfectly placed in that in that film and uh yeah god just another song that just resonates today then in the future in the past whatever you want to call it wake up like wake up to what's going on and now especially because there's just so much access to information where you really can use these lyrics and they're applicable to almost any subject. You're like, oh, God, we've been lied to, or oh, this is not how it looks like on the surface. Great song. Great. Right out of the gate, too. Just that, that buildup, like you were mentioning earlier, is quintessential to this, tri to this track. Well, and just like Freedom, he loses his fucking cookies at the end. Yeah. And it, it's got that inside-out vibe. This, I'm trying to think if I... This might have been one that I, like, when I first got into this album, I think I used to skip. And I don't know why. Really? Yeah. That's yeah. I don't know why. I think it was because this was after Know Your Enemy, maybe. I have to look at the sequence. Yeah. Wake Up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It went, know Your Enemy, Wake Up, and then Fistful of Steel. I used to skip those two. Wake Up and Fistful of Steel. Hmm. That's interesting. But I was young and dumb. So. I would probably skip Township Rebellion of the ones on the back half of, of that record. And Nate bringing up The Matrix. It is perfectly placed. Other than Neo flying at the end of it. Uh, th that whole sequence is like, you're being fed lies, like, figure it out. <laughs> this isn't, this isn't real. None of this is real. Uh, you should wake up. And it's such a crescendo at the end. And they, there's a lot of songs that do that. I mean, we, we've chronicled it here. The entirety of the catalog has uh, songs like this in it. So, but wake up is, I, it would have been one of my next picks too, Nate. All right, Nate, you're up. For your last, your last one. Another one. Another one. Oof. I'm going to go self-titled again on this one. Um, similar in the fact that it's prowlness and uh, lyrics are just, just all time. Take, take the power back. 
is the one that again just transferable today then now future whatever you want to call it just such a strong track and obviously just the name like the name captivates you right like what does this mean all right i'll play it wow okay it's like it's a story it's undeniable one of those undeniable songs yeah nate uh great pick great song it is kind of a band named Rage Against the Machine giving you a song called Take the Power Back. Everything fits, right? This is just a, the last piece of the puzzle, even though it's early on in their discography and career. But it totally fits their vibe, and, and the song is iconic rage. I, it just, it's just badass. It's, it's perfect. It's, it's one that I would have had up pretty high, too. Probably, I think I had it here in my top ten. Yep, I did. Shit, man. I, I, feel, bad for, <laughs> I feel bad for Battle of L.A. As much as I love Battle of L.A., Feel bad for it. Well, if there's one still on the board, I got one cooking. Ooh, nice. When it snakes back to me. This shows you the power of the catalog. How Take the Power Back, we have it at 10. In fact, I'm looking at my list. Maybe it was an oversight on my side. I didn't even have it in my top 12. One thing about this, and go back and listen to it, all-time Comerford bass oh, riff, yeah. little bass line. Boom, boom. The little yeah. Seinfeld thing. Oh, <laughs> yeah. It's so fucking good. And this was pre when he climbed that stanchion uh, for the uh, awards there. So, <laughs> Ian Robinson. Shout out Ian Robinson, who we uh, talked about that way back in the day. But, um, man, we're heavy. Like, what's the split here? Take an inventory here. One, two, three, four, five. This is the fifth self-titled song Yeah, for us. And we've got one, two, three, four from Evil Empire. I think this is probably how most people would have it up to this point. Yeah, even though I threw a wrench in it with the, the live cover. All right, I'll give you my last one here because we're going to go, what, four-piece. So uh, I'm going to go Year of the Boomerang. I needed to, get, uh, needed to get a song off of Evil Empire in here, and this song is a great bookend to this record. And it's just that weird, awesome kind of nails-on-a-chalkboard riff from Morello to start it, which in the moment, if you're not into the band and you're like, what the fuck am I listening to? Have you never heard of them before? But then you realize the how hard it is to do some of the stuff that he did, and uh, this this is perfect for them. And it's more of Zach giving his, uh, you know, hip hop delivery that is, I think, kind of in the moment didn't realize it was happening on this record. But now looking back on it today and and doing this exercise, finding more of that and loving that aspect of this band and this record in particular, just a, an all time rage song. You're the boomerang. How you started this is like was my thoughts too. Like I remember listening to this because this is the last song off Evil Empire. I remember listening to this and be like, I don't know what that noise is. I have no idea. I haven't heard that noise in my life. But this song, yeah, just Morello's crazy guitar work. It's just a funky song. Zach shows off the whole time and uh I'm trying to think. Oh, this is the is this the song that was the first song they wrote off Evil Empire? I think it was, because it was in the... I, this is something that came up in research. This was in the Higher Learning soundtrack. Remember that? John, John Singleton movie? I do remember that movie, yeah. Michael Rappaport, Omar Epps, maybe? Yeah. Rappaport, for sure. It probably was Epps. This, this came out, like, almost two years before Evil Empire. Drop. I did not, not know that. I yeah, I didn't know it until kind of researching this. And it has the uh, T-H-A for the, which was, uh, you know, back then, you're like, that's so cool. Great way to close the album out, though. Uh, yeah, Omar Epps and 95 was the movie, so right around the same time. Good call. I didn't realize that it was on that soundtrack. I remember watching that movie in the moment, you know, a couple nice. years after. Yeah. Shout out to Andrew in Florida. He, he got me onto higher learning. Yeah, that intro to the song, I remember thinking, is that like a squealing pig? Like, what the fuck is that? Shit? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's so weird. But yeah, the hip-hop sensibility on this one is definitely... Definitely there. It's like the kick drum with Zach, and then you got this distortion guitar, and then it kind of goes into the random like acoustic riff, and then boom, back into the boom, bop, boom, bop, boom, bop. Spent the 80s in the Haiti state of mind. Like, sick, dude. Such a great line. So good. I originally had this higher, for sure. I didn't drop it, but uh, this was, for me, like my favorite Rage song for the longest time. And I remember the first time I heard it was at our friend Mike's house. And his brother played it. And I remember thinking that same thing. Like, what's this? Like, what is this screeching sound? And then when it goes into the hip hop thing, you're like, oh, it's like a, it's like a rap rock song. So this is pretty cool. And then watching like the live VHS tapes of them performing this song, some crazy massive festival in Europe. But it's, it always took that like 
you know, like what the fuck's going on? Because we were so young and like music that's already so, I don't know, complicated and complex. And then just a way to open a song like that is just, I don't know. It's definitely not something that I could see a record label being like, yeah, let's run with it. Yeah, this, I had this at nine. So I'm right there with you guys. This was a uh, sleeper of a track. Cause like you had to back then, obviously CDs were out, but like you had to kind of, bands had to earn people getting to the last track. So if you had to, you know, for people to still be listening, the album had to be fucking good. And this was an <laughs> untouchable album. That's a good point. That's a really good point. It's my closing us out here. Yeah, close us out, Twan. What do you got? I'm bucking the trend, and I think I'd have to look at my original kind of notes here. I think I had this at five. So it's going to be the first song we're picking off Battle of LA. It's Born of a Broken Man. Nice. And it's, it starts off very quiet. You have no idea where the song is going to go. And then I think it has a top three Morello riff at the 25 second mark when it comes in brown brown and you're so like so good he bends the fuck out of that like i'm not a guitar guy but like i can't play guitar but i can recognize when something sounds good and that it just hits you so hard it could be the heaviest one of the heaviest rage riffs and like the lyrics i looked up the lyrics it's been a while since i've listened to the song pretty heavy stuff like he wrote this about his his dad and like i'm not going to read the lyrics but there's a analogy about like moths getting trapped in a lampshade go look it up it's just brilliant it's poetry and it's just poetry in the middle of this sick fucking heavy song it's amazing it's what makes them as good as they are that we got all the way to the 12th song before we grabbed a song off of battle of la which we i think we all ride for is a great record but there's just so many good songs in the catalog and if i had to pick one off of this record it's either this or maybe Ashes in the Fall because of the cool riff at the beginning of that one and the breakdown in the middle. But fucking great, great pick. Yep. Yeah, for battle, I wonder if, you know, I, I remember when the, the press release came out with Rage breaking up. It's like, as they had stated, or Zach said, I'm leaving the band. We are creative. We've lost all creative integrity. And I wonder if, if they had stacked the songs and been like, dude, none of these songs that we just put out even come in our top 10. Like, yeah, well, we've lost our creative collectiveness let's just call it call it you know but yeah this song dude i had this i had mic check and i had war within a breath is like top tracks from battle of la and it's not because they're not stackable against the others they just there's just so much good material here but that song man born of a broken man when you're talking about him with that like crazy guitar thing at 25 you can see the visuals like anytime you see morello things on youtube you can see him like using the knobs like all the things that people don't use live it's like for like a tune and then you play for the rest of the song he does it in performance and in recording, clearly, which uh, I think is very unique to him. I don't know anyone else that does that. He's a legend, man. He's a legend. Raging against that dishwasher, though. <laughs> I thought it was a washing machine. A printer, dude. Everyone has trouble with printers. <laughs> the printer, good call, Nate. The fax Raging machine. Raging against the fax machine. Speaking of fax, what you just heard was an hour of fax. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think, like, if someone had beef with our lineup, what do you think it would be? my uh live song that's not theirs but that's i mean i don't care <laughs> yeah it doesn't matter hey at me we're cool let's go <laughs> <laughs> uh, and i mean we we did a whole deep dive on the covers record there are like three or four songs that i would i would throw into here if we did like you know maybe five picks each or six picks each because they took those songs and made them their own too so this band is amazing and there's a reason that we we wanted to do this and there's also a reason we haven't done the deep dive on a record because we would probably all be sad that it was over yeah i think that's kind of my thought it's like do we want to i'd want to like spend a lot of time prepping and oftentimes we don't because we want to get it right you know but man untouchable uh untouchable band i i, I i've always kind of said this they're probably my favorite they are my favorite band of all time when i think of everything i think of the music the lyrics, the optics, the gatewayness, just man, I wouldn't have that Revelation Records um, poster on my wall if it wasn't for them. I mean, I just wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. You know, that's a whole nother world that it took me down. So, yeah, I'm kind of sad this episode's over. I know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. All right. Actually, I'm going to throw this in there. Spotify has the top listen to songs by bands. Uh, and I'll just go down the list here. Number one, Killing in the Name, which we had at number two. And not that popularity is a measure of anything, but uh, 
track number two, Bulls on Parade, we had at one. Gorilla Radio is three, no, didn't make our list. Sleep Now in the Fire, that's a little surprising. It's at four, we didn't have that on our list. And five is Bomb Track, which was in my, I think it was eight on my personal list, but did not make our, that just shows you, Bomb Track doesn't make a band's top 12 songs. Like, right. 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 Unreal. I had that one up high, uh, kind of high too. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll just read off what we had, so, and then who picked it. So number, number one, Twan had Bulls on Parade. Number two, I had Killing in the Name. Number three, Nate had Vietnam. Number four, Nate had Without a Face. Number five, I had Freedom. Number six, Tuan had Know Your Enemy. Number seven, Tuan had Down Rodeo. Number eight, I had Alive, Fuck the Police. Number nine, Nate had Wake Up. Number 10, we had Take the Power Back. That was Nate. And number 11 was Year of the Boomerang, and that was me. And number 12 was Born of a Broken Man, Tuan. So those are the 12 that we drafted tonight. That's a great set list. I want to hear that. I'm going to hear, listen to that in that order now. See what, see what it's like. Yeah, hit us up. Let us know if we get it right or wrong. And, you know, what, what songs did we, you think should have been drafted or drafted higher if we didn't draft them in the spot that you thought they should have gone? Hit us up. Five Evil Empire songs, five self-titled, one live and rare, and one Battle of L.A. Renegades, sorry, maybe next time. Maybe next time, yeah. yeah. Go back and listen to that episode. It's like, I want to say it's like episode 20 or 21. It's way back there. Ooh, maybe don't listen to it. <laughs> It's like when <laughs> bands put out their second greatest hits album. It's like some of those songs maybe shouldn't have made it. It's like when we do yeah. like our the next 13 through 24, there'll be some Renegade stuff in there. But that album's great. Go listen to that episode. See you later, guys. See you next time. Peace. Peace, potheads. Cheers, nerds. Thank you for listening to Patio Slave. We are at Patio Slave on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, all of the places that you can find us on social media. Facebook, Patio Slave Podcast. YouTube, Patio Slave Podcast there. Email us at Podcast at gmail.com. And hey, if you want to become a supporter, click on the link at the bottom of the episode and give us a dollar, give us five bucks. It keeps the lights on, keeps us going. We really appreciate that stuff. Thank you. But like you said, we didn't touch the covers record, so we could you know, go more into depth with that. But we did, um, Nate, we did a whole episode on the coverage record. Oh, is, that, is that what you were saying? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> you Scrap that. Start Scrap over, that. yeah. Scrap that. <laughs> Save that for the end.